I, I met so many people who have been hurt by relationships. They've had bad breakups, they've dated the wrong person, they've struggled with connection, maybe they've been abused, whatever it may be. And one question I'd always ask people is, what did you attract them with? What did you use to get that person? What did you show of yourself? What did you display? What was your best behavior? And what I've discovered is that when your relationship starts like an interview, chances are it might end like a firing. Because we start with our best behavior, we start with our best performance, we start with oh, look how attractive I am, look how wealthy I am. So if we're using things like money to impress someone, what do you think you're attracting? You're attracting someone who's with you because of that particular asset. Now, if that asset ever diminishes, if that asset is never accessible to them, if that asset is not something that they get to take part in, now all of a sudden they're not interested. Mm -hmm. If someone's only with you because of how you look, because that's what you displayed. So you have to ask yourself, am I displaying what I want someone to be attracted to, or am I trying so hard just to attract them that I'll show them whatever they wanna see? And so to me, when I think about it, I want someone to be attracted to my values. I want someone to be attracted to my purpose. I want someone to be attracted to who I actually am, not who they want me to be or who I could be. So when I met Radhi and when I'm working with clients, I always say to them, be so transparent and honest about where you currently are. Because then if you don't attract that person, you're safe. Mm -hmm. Because if you attract them through something you're not, you're gonna lose them through who you are. Oh God, that was so fire, dude. So how on earth and in those moments, right? Because when you're going on a date, when you're first meeting someone, you do want to put your best foot forward. Yeah. It's like, to be honest, if you went on a date and the woman showed up in her PJs, <laughs> right, even though we all love Raddy, maybe she on that do, first she, date. She would, did it on like the third date. There you go, yeah. right? So like, even on that first date, you're never going to see the true person because you do want to see their best, what they have. Yeah. But I totally understand on your point of that you can be setting yourself up and your relationship up for disaster if you do that. So talk to me now about your amazing skill of doing the three date rule because I love this because as we start to talk about who you decide to spend the rest of your life with these early days these early moments really do make a difference about whether you choose the right person that shares the same values as you or not. yes yeah and, and I love that you made that distinction because I think in the beginning the challenge is we don't even want to be with that person we just want to impress them so I think that's what I'm trying to get at is that nuance of like are you dressing up because you're presenting your best version, or are you actually doing all these things just to impress that person so they think you're awesome? <laughs> because if that's the reason, then you're showing them a very limited view of who you are. So my three date rule is something I'm gonna clarify as a disclaimer. You do not have to make these your first three dates, right. and you don't have to make these three dates have to go in order. While you're dating someone, these are three dates that can be dotted across any dating time period. So you could do one of these dates a month if you're seeing someone every week. Right. You could do one of these dates every three months if you're seeing someone for a year. You don't have to do them immediately. The other thing I'm gonna add before I dive into this is, I read this incredible study that shows that it takes around 40 hours to get to know someone casually. 40 hours, Lisa. It takes around 100 hours to get to know someone as a friend, to really call someone a friend. And if someone's a good friend, studies show it takes 200 hours. Now, the reason why I created the three-date rule is because too many people are falling in love too quickly. People say, I love you so quickly. Some men are saying it within one to three months, and some women are saying it within like three to six months. It's a fast process. Most of us have not spent 200 hours with each other. And just to pause there, yeah. men say it quicker and more often than women Absolutely. based on your stats. Okay, Absolutely, sure yeah. Men say, right. yeah, men say it quicker and more often to more people, Ah. right? And so there's a speed there. And I've, I've thought about that, like someone's asked me like, you know, why is that? I mean, it could be many things. It could be that, you know, we've been told that it's the secret key. You know, like a lot of men have been told that, oh, when you say I love you to a woman, that opens yeah. up everything, like you get access to everything. So maybe that's part of it. Maybe a part of it is that men don't know how to differentiate between lust and love, mm -hmm. like and love. 
I know men who come to me and they'll find someone new attractive every month. It's normal as a man to, to have that, but you don't know how to differentiate between lust and love or like and love. And so you say love more often. So sometimes it's a vocabulary understanding. Um, but anyway, going back to the three date rule, the first date has to be about, do I like this person's personality? Do I get along with them? Do I like their company? Most of our time in a day is spent thinking, do they like me, <laughs> right? That's mm -hmm. what we're thinking. Do they like me? Are they impressed by me? Do they think I look good? Do they think that I'm a good person? So but we're not really thinking like, do I like spending time with a person? Do I really engage with them? Do I really connect with them? Do I feel this person has like great morals and great, great sense of company? Are they funny? Are they interesting? And I think for a long time, we've overestimated the spark. And I wanna talk about this because I'm not saying there should be no spark. I think the problem is when relationships are built on sparks, not skills. And I think what you're really looking for is, is there a spark and skills, or am I only seeing spark and no skills? And the problem is when we see a spark, we assume that the person has the skills. And when you say the skills, you mean? I mean, like, when we get to skills, I'm talking like, does this person know how to communicate with you? Right. Does this person know how to listen to you? Does this person know how to make you feel seen and heard? Does this person want to develop skills with you mm. of fighting better, disagreeing better, debating better? Are they wanting to grow them, even if they don't have them? Mm. And what I find is that when we find the spark with someone, when we feel chemistry with someone, we assume that they're organized, good people who will treat <laughs> us well, right? We've it's all so done true. that. You find someone attractive <laughs> and you find someone articulate and you think they must be yeah. amazing at everything. Mm. And you just assume that. You never ask, you never check. So that's date one. Do you like their company? And the way the test is, do I want to spend 200 hours getting to know this person? Oh, it's that. a great test, yeah. 200 hours, because that's what a long-term relationship is going to need. Second date. Do I respect their values? This one's really big because I find that we don't often really understand our partner's values till much later. Mm -hmm. We don't really know what they care about or we're hoping we care about the same things. I think you and Tom can relate to this and me and Radhi can too. I don't think we prioritize the same things in the same way. Right. I think we have different values. And I think a lot of people live in this social media world of like, find someone who has the same values. Like, find so And I'm like, well, that may take your whole life. You may never find the person who has the same values. So in second date, you're trying to understand their values. What do they care about most? What's their biggest priority? You can tell some of this by what people talk about. If someone's always talking about their business, it's obvious what they care about the most. That doesn't make them a bad person or a good person. They're showing you. If someone's always talking about their mom and their dad and their family, it's obvious that their family is their heart and soul. You're one of those people. <laughs> You're always talking about your family and it's beautiful. And then you meet someone who's always talking about money. They're always talking about real estate. They're always talking about, they're showing you what they care about. And we don't often take that note. We take it a different way. So the way I look at this is I often ask clients, to make a list of their top three priorities in their life, including themselves. And most often what I'll find is someone will say, you, i.e. my partner, the kids, and then me. And that's common. The one that's a bit more rare is where the person says me, as in myself at the top, you, and then the kids. And the common reaction is, how can you put the kids third? <laughs> like, how did you put the kids third? And the person's going, well, no, I had to put me first because if I'm strong and I'm steady, then I'll give more to you. The reason I bring that prioritization up is, what are your partner's top values? So for Radhi, my wife, her top value is family. Mm -hmm. We know that, right? You know Radhi well. She loves her family. She adores her family. Any conversation is about her family. Yeah. Any gift is about her family. Everything's about her family. And then me, mine's my purpose and my service. If you talk to me, I'm thinking about how to serve the world. I'm thinking about how to make an impact. I'm thinking about how do I get these tools accessible to anyone and everyone? Like, how do we really cascade these uh, teachings across the world? Very different values. But we discovered that very early on. And we had really open, honest conversations about how, rather, if it came down to it, I would choose my purpose over a family event. Mm -hmm. And Radhi said to me, if it came down to it, I'd choose my family event over going to something with you. 
Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm, all I'm saying is that that awareness and that conversation saves you from years of guilt tripping the other person. Oh, you never come with me to my events, Radhi. You're always with your family. Oh, you never ever like show up for me when I'm traveling because you're traveling with your family. We don't have that conversation because I'm really aware of her values. So that's date two. And date three is, am I committed to helping them achieve their goals? Do I want to see this person? Am I ready to go to any extreme, any level to see this person become the best version of themselves that they want to be? Am I willing to be there with them, holding their hand, helping them get there? If we're going to climb a mountain and they're climbing a different mountain, I'm going to help them climb theirs. Mm. And I find that most of us don't even know what our partner's greatest goals are. Most of us don't even know what their dreams are. Most, of, most people don't even know what their own dreams are, let alone their partners. Totally, exactly, exactly. So those are the three dates. They don't have to be your first three dates. They don't have to be your, all your dates in a row. They just have to be dates that have to happen during the dating journey. I love all of that, the way you lay it out. And I'm such a like, I have like these two parts of me, the emotional and then the very logistic. Yeah. So when you tell me like, okay, 200 hours, I need those kind of yeah. um, buffers, if you will, because I, will I can get in my head and go, after four hours, oh my God, I'm <laughs> out of my eye. Like I actually remember on my first day with Tom going, oh my God, is this the one, right? Like, because I'd never met a guy like him before. Yeah. But if I'd had the rule of, okay, these are the dates, these are the amount of hours, these are the things you need to do on these dates to kind of really assess whether they're right for you is so beautiful because it allows me now to also listen to my head as well as my heart like because these yeah. those two can all often be in conflict with each other yeah well um, that's where the spark takes over mm -hmm. the chemistry is so strong and i looked at the science of this that when you are attracted to someone or when you meet someone and it's exciting you're feeling excitement but you're also feeling stress mm -hmm. because the excitement is their heart the stress is do they think i am right the excitement is oh my god they're coming over here the stress is, are they going to talk to me? The excitement is, they gave me their phone number. The stress is, what do I text them? <laughs> so you're feeling this excitement and stress, and that's what makes it so fresh and new. Mm. And in that excitement and stress, you can make some bad decisions. We've all been there where you've made poor decisions because you're so intoxicated by someone or you feel so attracted to someone that you can make an unhealthy choice. Now, what happens is, as you spend more time with that same person, your stress decreases because you're comfortable with them. So when we say the spark went away, it didn't, the stress went away because now being with them actually calms you down. Like it actually gives you a sense of comfort. Yeah. And so when we think the spark's everything, it's not because the spark was just stress. But I think that that is where some people get confused, right? Where they're like, oh my God, the love is gone. Yeah. Like, oh no, <laughs> you know, and then you have like the honeymoon phase where then people leave. So during this first dating phase, once you started to do these things, establish like, okay, are they right for me? I want to touch on something you dropped in earlier of the definition of love. Mm. Because as you start to date, as you start to get with someone, start to know them more and more, I loved how you said, it's like you have to understand what the word love, like not even what the emotion of love means, but what the word love itself means. And then also understand what your partner's interpretation of it. Explain that to me. And then how we start to navigate that, because as we start to peel apart, some of these things are awkward, are uncomfortable to have a discussion <laughs> with. Are like, so how do you feel about <laughs> love, right? It's like, how do we start to like, actually then have those discussions yeah. and i was gonna say like even with these dates you're not sitting down with someone going what are your values <laughs> like you know like that's not number want, one yeah number one <laughs> like, you know here's a list of values can you circle which <laughs> ones are yours like it's not like saying oh what are your goals like it's, it's not that kind of a yeah. conversation like what i'm saying is you learn about someone's values by what they spend their time on what they spend their energy on and what they spend their money on that's what they value. If you really want to know what someone values, look at their schedule. That will tell you what they value. If you look at Radhi's schedule, she calls her mum eight times a day. You look at my schedule, it is decked out in meetings, <laughs> commitments, yeah. interviews, podcasts, whatever else it may be. That shows you what I value. If you look at what someone spends, who do they spend money on? Where do they spend money? Shows you what they value. So don't ask people these questions. You can observe mm -hmm. it just by being around someone very quickly. You don't have to be as on the nose. Right. And so going into what you were asking about defining love, this was something when I was coaching couples and working with them, I found this to be a huge thing. Some people say, I love you. And it means I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And some people say, I love you. 
and it means I want to spend a, a night with you. Mm -hmm. Like, it can be that different. It can really be in between those extremes. I want to spend a night with you or I want to spend a life with you. And the thing is, when someone says, I love you, you assume that their definition is the same as yours. So when you say, I love you back, you think in your head, we just made a contract right. based on my definition of love. Oh, we're going to die together. We're going to die together, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, you've committed to me for the rest of eternity, mm. right? Like, that could be your definition. And the thing is, when someone's being romantic and says, I love you, you don't go, wait, 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 what do you mean by that? Like, right. explain. we don't say that. And I'm not telling you to say that. But before you say it, before you feel it, before you exchange it with someone, or even after you do, have a conversation about what does love mean to you? Like, wh like, what do you mean by that? Like, what is the importance of love in your life? And if someone's not open to those conversations early on in a relationship, that's a sign that those conversations only get more uncomfortable. So if you've been in a relationship and you're struggling to start this conversation with your partner, how do you do it? I just want to address that because I can appreciate that a lot of people didn't have this training up front. They're now in a relationship. Right. They feel like they wanted a relationship to be fun and exciting. And their partner is settled for... We live together, we have a home, we have kids, that's love, what else do we need, right? I think it's really healthy to say, hey, you know what, when we met, when we first connected, we were young, we, di we didn't know about all these things, we didn't talk about all these things, but I've, I've really been thinking about this, like, we've built such a beautiful life together, and I wanna continue to feel that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the same way? Now you've not put pressure on them, if you go up to them and go, you don't do what you used to do before, How's that inspiring? If you go up to your partner and say, oh, you're always lazy, or you have more time for the guys than you do for me, or you go up to your partner and say, oh, you know, you're always busy, I thought you were gonna be at home, like, those things don't start healthy conversations, but saying, you know what, we've actually built something pretty cool, how do we get it to the next level if that can engage a partner? I, I love that. Um, yeah. It not being just one word, it actually being like this in-depth discussion that is continuous because I think that that's where we get tripped up. Sometimes we have an interpretation. Also, we do hear what sometimes we want to hear, right? Like the amount of people, I'm just going to say, the amount of women I have been met with, like, oh, I can change him. Oh, I can yeah. change this about him. I can change this. And it becomes the like, you're not actually hearing who they are. Yeah. And maybe you're just hearing the things you really do like and the things that you aren't attracted to or something that maybe you're, you're dismissing those right now because you so want this relationship. Yeah, and I think that's, we're living in a world of trying to project our version of a perfect partner onto our mm. partner and we're trying to mold them and curate them and build them up to be this person that we think will make us happy. And what we don't realize is that fake version we have won't make us happy. And us trying to mold them is not gonna make them happy. And you actually push someone away. Mm. So I actually feel like if anyone ever feels like someone's trying to change them, you potentially push them away because they feel threatened, they feel scared, they feel not fearful, good enough. not good enough. And so you're actually creating a unworthy feeling in your partner mm by saying you could be this or should be this. And I think we have this, I break it down in the book as being the difference between relationship roles we play. So I talk about how there's three relationship roles that everyone plays and everyone who's listening or watching, you know which one you are. So the first is the fixer. Some of us get our self-worth from fixing other people's problems. We don't fix our own, we're not working on our own, but we feel better when we find a partner that feels like a project. Mm. We feel, oh, I'll teach them and I'll build them up and I'll make them wear nice clothes and I'll make sure he or she gets a nice job or they break through in their career because we get our self-worth through thinking we can fix other people. Mm. It's really warped to that degree, but we play that role. And often when we play that role, we tire our partner out because they feel unworthy or we feel upset at ourselves and them because they didn't take our advice. Mm -hmm. So then we end up saying things like, well, I put so much effort into you and you don't want to be better. And we think it's their fault that they haven't grown, but they never showed you they wanted to grow. Mm -hmm. So if you're the fixer, I just want you to be really conscious about that role and say, okay, I've tried to fix people, it doesn't work. Let me use that energy to serve myself, to find my own self-worth in a different direction and now let me approach this relationship differently. The second role we play is the dependent. So the fixer is like a parent 
the dependence like a kid. You walk in and you hope that your partner's just gonna take care of you, they're gonna cradle you, they're gonna embrace you, they're gonna take all your problems away, right? We want a problem solver. We want a fixer. Mm. And we walk Why? in, we go, fix all my issues, you're in charge, you're the best. A few years later, sometimes it's decades later, that person goes, I lost myself in the relationship. Not realizing that they didn't know who they were in the first place, they let the other person take the lead, and now that person's lost. So even when you're the dependent, and then you start feeling, why are you always telling me what to do? Oh God, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because then it goes the other way, why are you always telling me what to do? Why? But we set them up to play that role. Mm. So let's take the responsibility and become supporters. A supporter says, I'm gonna help you become who you want to be. And you're gonna help me become who I want to be. Because support is not about me projecting my goals onto you. Support is about me helping you get to where you wanna go. And that is the healthiest role to play in a relationship. There are gonna be times in a relationship where you have to be the fixer, you have to be the dependent. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of oscillating, but you're both trying to come back to being supporters and being collaborators and being a team rather than staying too long in either of those. I think the other thing is that as fixers, one of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? We put time, effort and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner, PDF. We also think that we have to be the person to fix our partner's problems. We don't realize that sometimes you can introduce them to a book, sometimes you can introduce them to a podcast, sometimes you can introduce them to something else that helps them. And this is the biggest mistake, Lisa, that I hear all the time. People want their partners to have the same healing journey as them. Ooh. And I say this to people all the time. Sometimes someone will say to me, Jay, I'm just trying to convince my partner to read your book and I'm trying to convince <laughs> them to listen to your podcast. And I'm like, please don't do that because you're gonna push them away, not just from you, but from their healing. Mm. Find out what they connect to. Find out what's important to them. You know, one of the reasons why I love doing my podcast on purpose is I sit down with so many people and I'm like, there are so many people that I know people will connect to that may not connect to my voice. Sometimes you need to hear an athlete say, I need to meditate. I could have been telling people for years to meditate, but they needed to hear it from their favorite athlete mm -hmm. or someone needed to hear it from their favorite business person or someone needed to hear it from their favorite musician when she or they open up their heart and says, this is what I'm going through. And so please realize that your partner doesn't have to learn from the same voices or the same guides or the same coaches. It's okay for them to have their own path. And if you help them on their path, I promise you, you'll be holding hands a lot quicker. God, that's so true. And it's like, I understand the notion, right? Like we, if we are in a relationship and we now find someone that we really do care about, we really do love, there's this one thing that just keeps tripping them up. Maybe you've been there yourself. So you're like, oh my God, like I'm going to give the gift that I wish someone gave me. <laughs> yeah. And so you think you're giving the gift, but there's a difference between like the gift that you would want to receive versus the gift that that person wants totally. to receive. And sometimes we give the gift that we want to receive. We don't get the response and now we think it's about us yes yes that's exactly it like we think now that oh now it reflect now we have two issues we have the issue that they don't listen mm -hmm. and now i'm i need to I, i'm getting tired of being so magnanimous and we're not being magnanimous because real compassion is real compassion is meeting someone where they are and getting them to the next step on their journey, not yours. Yeah. Real compassion is understanding what inspires that person, what moves them, what motivates them. And if it's not the same as me, that's okay. We were just talking about this, me and you, we both love Christmas. And my wife likes Christmas, but I'm obsessed. I love Christmas, right? And so I was like, this weekend, I was like, it's Thanksgiving, we're gonna go buy a tree, we're gonna go put it up, we're gonna play Christmas music while we put it up. And she's like, sure, 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 sure. And I can't expect her to be as excited as me. I think that's unhealthy. Mm.
because can I be as excited about food as she is? I can't. I, I genuinely, I'm, I love her food. I'm excited about it. I can't be as excited as she is. Mm -hmm. We see our partners not being as excited as us as discredit to our likes and dislikes. Right, we that's see. So true. Right, we mm -hmm. see. If they're not as excited mm -hmm. about Christmas as I am, then they don't love me enough. Right, but that's not. Or there's true. something wrong with me of something... how much I love this. Correct. Yeah, or I'm wrong. Maybe I should like something mm -hmm. else. Maybe I'm not cool enough. Yeah. Uh, may yeah, maybe they like cooler stuff. And so we we make everything so much more different than what it truly is, which is just everyone has different likes and dislikes. Everyone has different values. And let's learn to love how much our partners love what they love, mm -hmm. rather than force our partners to love what we love. I love that so much. And you, you bring up values a lot, which I love, yeah. right? It's so important. As we start to talk about this, though, like, for instance, when you identified that you didn't have the same values as she did, how do you make it work? Because I, I think of values personally slightly differently. Yeah. I think of values as being like the core of my being. Mm -hmm. Like the core of my being is I will do anything for my family. Mm -hmm. But I don't show up every day like I would do anything for my family. Now, if Tom is like, I would never fucking do that. Like, <laughs> why would you ever show up for your family? Like, I would burn my family to the ground for my business. Now, imagine I'm the opposite of values, <laughs> right? Of that's values. so tall. I love how you sound like him too. <laughs> All the language. That's how well. But see, that's how well you know each other's values. Like, you can literally say it in his words. Anyway, sorry, go. Yeah, no, I do. Yeah. But in this situation yeah. where if I was to say, look, I'll burn the company down before I ever impact my relationship with my family. Yeah. If Tom was the opposite, now our values are directly conflicting with each other right yeah. and so but the truth is is that both tom and i while we spend most of our time on the business we have different interests in the business yeah. but we do spend most of our time at the end of the day we would both burn the company down to the ground for the sake of our family yeah um so how do you start to differentiate between yeah. the value system of how you show up every day and make these decisions to the core values of your being? Because I believe you and Raddy, and I'll put it in my own words, not to throw words in your mouth, your base core foundation values is exactly the same. Meaning that she'd never ask you to not be yourself because she so appreciates and respects you that she understands your core values of your purpose is fundamentally who you are. Mm -hmm. And so she'd never ask you to go past that. I think you have the same respect with her. Yep. So even though yours is purposes and hers is family, the core of it is very aligned. Yeah, no, that's a great breakdown. And I, I think that what you're saying with core values, because you and Tom are married and you have, a and you have multiple businesses mm -hmm. together at this point, it's like that impacts a lot of life, right? Like you both are building the same thing and a part of a bigger thing. Right. That's different when you're in business together because yes, you do need the same core value because you're building something and that. Mm. Whereas when you're building a marriage and, and looking at values, yes, I would agree that me and Radhi do have the same core being values about each other. But I guess what I'm saying is I would never ask her to trade her family for, pur for my purpose, right. and she'd never mm. asked me to trade my purpose for her family. We accept that we're both individuals who have certain things that are deeply important to us, and the more you get to do what's important to you, that fulfills you and fuels you, but you're not gonna pull me away from what's mm. important to me to make yourself feel better. Mm. You realize that I need that too, because what ends up happening is, let's say every time I had and I'm using my example, but I mean, I'll take a client, like I had a client who was an athlete and he wanted his partner to be there at every game in the stands, cheering him on, right? He wanted yeah. her to be at every game, cheering him on in the stands, going, yeah, honey, like, come on, whatever. And like after the game, like bring the kids, <laughs> hug him. Like that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Now she was really successful in her own right and had her own business. She had to be on work trips. She had to be traveling on weekends. She couldn't be there every weekend. And he couldn't understand how anything was more important than her being at the game. He was just like, how, how can you not? The, the game is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And she was like, honey, I know the game's important. Whenever I'm in town, I'll be there. But I'm also building something that's mm -hmm. important to me. So that's where I go. That's what I've seen break relationships apart, where it's like, you don't value my values as much as me. And no one can, like, as much as she loves him and she loves the game, she can't say that game is more important than mm -hmm. my business. That's not fair mm -hmm. to her. And I've seen too many people 
put their values or purpose on the back burner for decades, only three decades later to say, I was so focused on helping you get to where you wanted, I didn't get to where I wanted. And when you're 50, 60 years old and feeling that way, I don't think there's anything more hurtful that you think the people that you love and the person that you love, they got everything they wanted out of life, mm -hmm. but you didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really hard. That's what I'm trying to speak yeah. to, if that makes sense. That was so powerful. Yeah. Um, and obviously I've, I've been in that situation, yeah. right? For eight years, I was yeah. supporting Tom. I let go of my own values, my own purpose. Like, um, and it wasn't until I realized, oh, I need to actually speak up. I need yes. to say that I'm the one like, hey, I'm not happy here. Um, and I didn't do that. And so that was really, I think, a powerful part of what you just said. And then the-, the But that's the bravery. In, oh, sorry, I don't no, want to cut no, you please. off. I was just saying, but that's your bravery, right? Like, and I, and I said this to you on message yesterday, we were messaging about today. And I really mean this. And I said the same thing to Tom, like you guys are such an amazing couple. Mm -hmm. The way you share advice, I learn from you guys every day. Mm -hmm. I love your rules. I love your principles. I, I love everything you share about relationships. But you've also been through multiple relationship transitions. Mm -hmm. And what you just spoke about, it took bravery and self-awareness on your part to actually share it and twist the plot. <laughs> it's a plot twist. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tom thinks he's getting a housewife. <laughs> The housewife goes, I want to be an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's a plot twist. And yeah. it's like, oh, wow. And then it's beautiful that Tom was open to that transition going, well, if Lisa wants to be happy and this is going to make her happy, if I love her, I should support her. But I see that either happening too late mm. where someone sat in silence, like people sit in silence of what they want in a relationship for decades. And then when they finally raise their voice, their partner thinks, why didn't you tell me earlier? Mm. But then they think, well, why didn't you care about what I wanted either? Why was it always about you? And then it becomes so complicated. So the fact that you had the courage to do that after eight years is incredible. And the fact that Tom had the companionship to want to work with you on that, that's what a beautiful relationship is made of. But I find that that transition often doesn't go as healthily and smoothly because the person in Tom's position goes, but you committed to this. Right, you right. signed mm -hmm. up for this. You subscribed to this. Like, how are you copping out now? Oh, you're not the person I thought you were. Right. That was, thank you. That's yeah. very kind coming from you. And the one thing that I loved that you talk about, but I didn't have words to it, but you call it like your dharma. Yeah. And that when you have, um, there basically there's three relationships in your relationship and it all comes back to dharma. So explain that to me because like having a word to use was so powerful because I think that's what made me pivot, right? That's what exactly allowed me to go, oh, I don't want to live this life. This is a life that I now want and allow Tom to support me. Yeah, so Dharma is the, or Dharma is the Vedic word for purpose. And Dharma is made up of three key things. The first is your passions. The second is your strengths or expertise. And the third is service. It has to be used to serve other people. Mm -hmm. So when you know what you love and you know what you're good at, and then you use that to serve people or impact people, that's Dharma. And what we find is that every relationship is made up of three relationships. The one you have with each other, but then there's two more. The one with you have with your purpose and the one they have with their purpose. And often what ends up happening is we make it all about this relationship with each other and we ignore our independent and collective purposes. And so I find that what you found in that scenario, taking your example, was you had this spark inside of you saying, I have a purpose too. I have a dharma too. I have something to offer the world. And I see that today when I was walking down here and I made a little video that I'm going to post, but I was looking at all your artwork and it's unbelievable, right? You come to this set and you see this show and you're like, look at what you've achieved, like, look what you've built. And you've constantly make str made strides to move closer to your dharma. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen in one go. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like, oh, one day, oh, honey, I'm not a housewife anymore. I'm just going to go out there. It was, no, I'm, I'm doing this. Oh, now I get this inkling that I should be in front of camera too. Like, I want to interview people too. I have, a, I have a message. Yes. Oh, you know what? I used to love art at school and my teachers used to always tell me that I couldn't draw and paint, but I really feel inspired. I'm going to give myself permission. And then you create all this, like, so that's the journey that I'm encouraging people to go on and voice that to your partner, explain it to them. Don't just do it in a silo. What we often feel about our partners is if they don't ask, they don't care. <laughs> if they're not asking me about my purpose or my dharma or my passions, they don't care. 
Chances are your partner doesn't have the vocabulary either. Chances are they don't know that. And so involve them in that conversation. Say to them, hey, you know what? I've really been struggling with like finding meaning in life at the moment. And I'm just trying to find what I want to do in the world and what I want to give to the world and open up that dialogue. I think the problem is most of our conversations about our partners happen with other people. Right? <laughs> just right? So true. We talk about our partners to our moms, <laughs> our dads, our sisters, our friends, our brothers, everyone, but we don't talk about it with them. And and it's really strange to me that literally for years you can go years and years and years talking about your partner to everyone else in your life but them. Talk to them. I, I sit down with so many people who tell me their challenge. I'll be like, can you say that? to your partner, just like you said it to me. Because when you said it to me, it was really calm, it was perfect, but when you say it to them, it's an accusation. When you say it to them, it's pointing fingers. So please go and say it to them in this way, because I, I promise you, if, if you can sit down and help your partner out with what you're thinking and what you're feeling, they have a better opportunity of being there for you. And the reason why I'm giving the responsibility to you, to this person, is because the more you sit there expecting someone to understand you, you're taking away time from you expressing what you're going through. Mm. You expressing what you're going through is going to lead to a healthy relationship. You expecting the other person to understand you without your expression, you'll be waiting for your entire lifetime. That that is so strong because a lot of us don't want to feel needy, right? It's like, yes, well, no one is telling yes, what I need yes. because now I'm going to be that woman that's feeling really needy. So this was me and Tom, right? So yeah. I was like, oh, I can't tell him what I want. Like, yeah. I'll just hint to him. And then in the hint, when he wouldn't <laughs> get the hint, it was like, oh, he, does, he doesn't even listen. He doesn't even yeah. pay attention. And I've told this story. I think I've told you, but stop me if I have already. But no, this, came to, this came to fruition in this one instance when Tom and I very first met, it was Christmas time. And I was hinting to him, Jay, that I wanted a watch. Because I couldn't tell him, right? It was like, I can't ask for a watch. Like, that's extravagant. So I was hinting, I was hinting. Months go by. I told him that I'm hinting. He's like, I've nailed it. I know exactly what you want. So Christmas Day comes <laughs> and we were split. We were apart. He was in America and I was in England. And I opened it up expecting to see a watch. And it was teeth whitening strips. <laughs> wow, that is so teeth bad. Teeth whitening that strips. That is so bad. You can... How far how, off the yeah, poor man went? Not just that, that's also a bad <laughs> gift to give to someone. It's like, how often did I complain about yeah, the whiteness yeah. of my you, teeth? You think my teeth are not white enough? <laughs> like, yeah, it's terrible, Tom. And in yeah. that moment, I realized he was so excited because he thought he nailed it. Yeah. So leading up to me opening the gift, he was like, I can't wait. I've got it. I've nailed it. So when it was so wrong, yeah. I just had to laugh. And then when I told him the story, it broke his heart at yeah. first. And I was like, oh my God, I find this so funny. And he's like, I thought I nailed it. Yeah. And seeing that I disappointed him because I wasn't just saying what I actually wanted was a very early lesson for us that people aren't mind readers. You've got to t set your palm up for success. If you really That's believe really they want to deliver for you, yeah. then you not telling them is actually doing them a disservice. I love that. I love that. And I love that story too. <laughs> it's so <laughs> good. Watching teeth right. It's so good. Me and Riley have a gift story similar to that, but she wasn't, well, yeah, I, I probably reacted like not as well as you did. <laughs> did but, you? Yeah, so I did, I, do you know this story? No, I told you. Uh, so, so it was Christmas as well, or maybe it was, my, I think it was Christmas or my birthday. I'm trying to remember. It was early on. And um, I'd dropped a lot of hints too as to me wanting a white iPad mini. Like I wanted one of those small <laughs> iPad minis. I was very clear about wanting to be white, very clear about the iPad, very clear about the mini. This is like, you know, 10 years ago now. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking for this gift. And, and hinting again, I'm not being over, I'm hinting. Christmas day comes or my birthday comes, can't remember which one. It's all wrapped up beautifully and all the rest of it. And, and it's, the, it's the exact size, I'm so excited. I'll open it up. It's an Asus. A what? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to Asus the brand. But I was like, it's an Asus. So Asus makes tablets. And I'm sure they're oh. wonderful tablets. Like, I'm sure they're wonderful. And I'm, I'm, I'm no, no offense sure. to an Asus. I have never used one, but no offense. I wanted a white. And so I looked at her and she was like, mm. is everything okay? And I was like, you, you were kind of there. Like she was closer yeah. than Tom. But, but I was like, like, what made you get this? And she was like, 
oh, you know, what? I was talking to my family and they told me you could get a really good deal and this was like the best value for money and like this was like a really smart one to get because it's like the most amount of this for this. And I was like, oh, interesting. And it really hit me that like Riley had tried her best. She was about to buy an iPad. She spoke to someone who had a different set of values. She spoke to someone who had a different insight on what was important. For them, important was saving money, buying something that had the right thing. And obviously everyone who's watching this in the comments is going to be like, yeah, Apple's not great for tech, right? <laughs> all the people who don't think Apple's great tech. And I agree with all of that. I love the user experience. I'm basic. I'm yeah. basic. I want the user experience and you have your preference. And what I realized was she tried her best, but it's like that's when, what happens when you listen to other people mm. instead of listening to your partner. Mm. And that's what we do a lot of. We listen to other people in our relationships. And I used to do the opposite. So by the way, I made mistakes too. With Ravi, whenever she'd said she'd like something, I wanted to be Superman. So I'd buy it immediately and she'd have it the next day. And she'd look at it and be like, oh no, I was just thinking about it. Like, I don't even want it. I was just thinking it might be useful. And then she wouldn't use it. And I'd be like, that's terrible. Like, I just get a gift. I got it for you fast. And again, it's like, we're not listening. I'm not really listening. I just want to be Superman. Mm -hmm. I just want to be seen as like the all provider and can do anything. And now I feel sad because I didn't listen to you. And so I, I would encourage people to speak more to your partner about your partnership listen more to your partner about your partnership mm -hmm. of course take advice and guidance but but don't stop talking to each other because in those moments you almost both feel badly right yeah. you feel like oh god i'm not superman like this is something that i value in myself exactly. to be there for my wife and yeah. now rally though doesn't feel heard like it's almost like exactly. well, just because i said it like that isn't right like or the fix it thing where it's like oh my god i really want to get it you she's like well don't you know me? I'm just thinking through it. Yeah. And now she feels like you don't even know me. You think that I just want to run you to run out and get it. And now you're both missing that beat. Exactly. And as we start to talk through, right, you've met someone, you found someone in your life. As we start to talk through these struggle moments, these are the moments that the small things can start to stack. Yeah. So if you don't mind talking about the big key items that actually get us into danger in our relationship, but also these small little things where you don't feel heard, you don't feel like you're giving a chance. And now over time, you put these big things with these day-to-day -day things and now you blink and you wonder what happened to your relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to think about this, especially when you're building a home with someone, you have to think about a crack in your floors or a crack in the wall. Mm. At the start, it's just a little crack. Or maybe it's not even a crack, it's just a scratch, mm. right? It's just a scratch. And you're like, oh, it's just a scratch, it's okay. You can't see it, you just cover it with the couch, right? That's like a scratch in your relationship. There's something about your partner you're not fully comfortable with, but it's okay. It's fine. You can look over it. It's, it's, uh, it's tolerable. Mm. All of a sudden, that scratch turns into a little crack. Now it annoys you. Every time you see it in your living room, you're like, oh, God, I wish that wasn't there. All right, but I can still cover it up. We do that in our relationship. Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's not important. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to worry about it. It's all good. The thing is, as time goes on, all of these cracks get bigger. Now that crack's like going up the wall. Mm or going down the floor, and now you're looking at it going, that needs to get changed. And by then, you're thinking about changing it. Now, when you apply that to a partner, it's like, am I with the right person? Right, you're asking different questions, and the problem is you're waiting to ask an extreme question before solving a small problem. Mm -hmm. And if you just dealt with it when it was there, where it was, it would be so much healthier. And I think we're scared, like you said, because we don't want to be needy, we don't want to come across as demanding, and we don't want to come across as someone who always needs something fixed. <laughs> all, all healthy things. But I think there's a way of talking about these things that we often underestimate. So if I'm going to bring up something like this to Radhi, first thing I'd say is, hey, I noticed this is going on. Is there something you're struggling with to, to make this right? Or, or what, what are you going through that it's this way? So I'm trying to understand saying I've noticed something, but I'm not placing my assumption on it. I'm not saying I noticed this and I feel like you don't care about me. Let me take a beat and say, I noticed this, what's going on? And she may say to me, Jay, I've just had so much on this week, been really stressed out, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. I, I just had a lot on, right? Or she may say, oh, I didn't realize that was important to you. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know. Like, it wasn't even like I was trying to make it important. I just didn't realize that was important to you. I'm, yeah. I, I didn't know. Whereas when you walk in there and you're already assuming and you're ac accusing someone and you go, yeah, you, you know, you just always never do the dishes. You never do this. You never do that. You never finish this. That person doesn't get a chance to have a conversation with you. Now they go into defense mode. 
And so what I find is that accusing your partner feels like an attack. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't create an opportunity to connect. It creates an opportunity for them to defend. Now you're in attack and defense mode instead of in connection mode. Mm -hmm. And that's all created because of how you phrased what you noticed. <laughs> like literally, the t and so the tiny things are tiny, mm -hmm. but the tiniest thing is how you say something to your partner. I promise you, you could give feedback to your partner and it could transform your lives, or you could say something to your partner and it would force them to feel like you don't like them or care about them, just in how you said it. Oh my God, I love that. And you talk about how we don't talk about conflict enough. Yeah. Like we don't talk about how to handle conflict. And it, was, it really hit me, like it struck me like a, a you know, ton of bricks. I love being like stopped in my tracks. When you were like, we all talk about love languages, but none of us talk about conflict languages. Yes, and yes. I was like, Jay, yes! <laughs> like, talk to me about how we, our conflict language and yeah. how we approach this. Dude, it's fucking genius. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I spent a lot of time, I love Gary Chapman's five love languages. Mm -hmm. I recommend every couple does it. It's fantastic. When I looked at the Gottman Institute research, John and Julie Gottman, who I've interviewed a bunch of times, they talk about how we need skills in relationships. And the number one skill we need is learning how to fight, learning how to argue. Now, I'm not saying that you should be having full blown arguments where you're swearing at each other and cussing each other out and then afterwards being like, we love each other. But you are going to disagree you are going to debate and you are going to argue in any relationship. It is unlikely for there to not be that. So why not be prepared? Mm -hmm. So I thought about this a lot and I really thought about it with me and Radhi and I realized that just as we have love languages, we have fight styles. And so just imagine this for a second. You fight MMA, but your partner's a kickboxer. Right. It's not working. You can't mix those styles as much because that person's not being able to fight on the same playing field. There are three fight styles that I discovered. The first fight style is venting. A venter is, I wanna talk about it, I wanna talk about it now, we have to solve it now. I'm a classic venter, <laughs> right? You are, I'm a classic I venter. Guess that. And then the second fight style is hiding. Hiding is, I wanna go into a little room, I wanna be on my own, and I wanna figure it out by myself, and I don't know when I'm coming out. There's a lot of people who like to hide. Mm -hmm. And the third one is exploding, where it's like everything becomes bigger, where it's like, God, you always do this, it never goes right, I'm, I'm feeling so much pain, like you just, every, you, all your emotions just explode. So you're not trying to, f you're not feeling like you need to talk about it now, you're not running away, it's just exploding. None of these are good or bad or wrong or right. No one should feel less than because we deal with it a certain way. We deal with it the way our parents dealt with it, we deal with it the way our parents didn't fulfill in us or people in our life didn't fulfill in us. It comes from our trauma. So for me, I'm a fixer, I wanna solve it now. Radhi's a hider. When I first shared with Radhi that I got a new job offer to move to New York, this was six years ago, seven years ago, Radhi didn't talk to me for two days because she was so scared that she'd have to leave her family. And this was one of the biggest transitions we went through in our, in our lives. But because I knew family was her priority, I was already aware this was gonna to be tough for her. I knew she would need space. Her way of telling me we could move to New York two days later was she bought New York bed sheets and she put them on the bed. And I was like, does that mean New York's here? Or does that mean we can go? <laughs> yeah. and I was like, like, sorry, we're not going to yeah, New York, but New York. I brought it here. Yeah, right here. Which one is it? Anyway, we moved to New York and now we live in LA. But the point I'm making is that for years, me and Radhi argued because she wanted to hide and think about things and I wanted to talk about it. And for me, anytime she wanted to hide, the voice in my head said, she doesn't care about you. She doesn't care about this relationship. You value this relationship more. She needed space because she was like, I value this relationship. I love you. I need to think about this. She was like, I don't need, I don't want to say some things I don't mean. I don't want to say something hurtful. So I need to decompress. Without knowing our fight styles, we both walk away feeling like the other person doesn't care when actually their style shows they care in their language. So then we realized rather than needed two days, I wanted to talk about it now. We found a happy medium when we meet to talk about an argument for us after four hours to 12 hours. That's our, our gap that we give each other. For us, now that for you, that may be one day, for you, it may be one hour. Yeah. We found that our sweet spot was that. 
I didn't want to wait longer than four to 12 hours to talk about a fight. And she didn't want to wait any less than because she needed it. And is that how you came to that conclusion where you both sat down? She said, look, this is what I need. You said, OK, this is what I need. You um, maybe vocalized that two, hour, uh, two days was too long for correct, you. Correct, correct. OK, that's a Yeah, exactly. Like, like a compromise. Yeah, and it is. And, it, and what I see is like healthy game planning. Right. right? It's like <laughs> saying, like, we know we're going to argue next time. And when we have a disagreement or we're coming home from a family event, we both have a fight about something ridiculous. I don't want to wait two days to talk about it. And she's like, but I need four to 12 hours to talk about it and to think about it. I'm like, that's cool. So you're creating a healthy standard for you that you're both aware of. Now, I'm not anxious going, oh, my God, when are we going to talk about right. it? And she's not anxious going, oh, my God, I'm going to get rushed into a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I find like these simple things break relationships because we don't create strategies and skills around our feelings. And I think the other issue is you just said a word and it really hit me. We often tell our partners what we need, but we don't tell them enough why we need it. Mm. And I cannot emphasize the why more importantly. I can say to Radhi, hey, Radhi, you know what? I need this weekend to myself. Or I want to spend this weekend with the guys. Guess what? If you leave that sentence incomplete without the why, your partner could well off think they don't want to spend time with me, they don't enjoy spending time with me, they choose those friends over me. Mm -hmm. That could be the voice in their head. Even if they're secure, even if they love you, even if you have a great relationship, if you explain what you need, you're letting your partner autofill why you need it. Whereas when you say, you know what, I haven't seen one of my best friends for like a month. I just wanna hang out with him. So I'm gonna take our evening, I know it's our only free evening this week, but do you mind if I just spend time with him? I often say to Radhi, Radhi, you know what, I'm going into interview mode. For the next few weeks, mm. I'm, I'm going on so many podcasts, I'm going to so many events, I want to be prepared, I want to be organized. I'm going to be less present unless you really want me to be and tell me you want me to be present. But just so you know, I'm going to be on my phone, I'm going to be doing this. Now that she knows that, she knows if she needs my attention, she can say, hey, I want you to be present. But she also is not mad at me for being on my phone. But when you don't say that and you just do it and you go, well, you should know how hard I'm working. You should know how much I've got going on. It's like, can you expect that person to know? So I feel these little things create big issues in relationships. And I just wish, you know, the book gives tools and questions and ways to start conversations to help you have healthier conversations. Dude, that was so good. I love that you warned her even about the phases that you're going into. Like, that's so amazing so that she doesn't start, especially if it's a phase that becomes, you know, I'm sure for you, it's like months and months of this book launch, right? So kind of going into it going, okay, it's not just going to be one week. And if I say to, hey, look, for this week, I'm just not going to be available. And then the next week you say again, the next week you say again. Now she's like, hang on a minute. Am I just chump change, right? Exactly. But being able to say for the next two months, babe, this is what I'm focused on. But if you need me, I'll show up. But I'm not necessarily going to appear out of my own fruition. Correct. And this is what I'm going to need. Like, I, mm. I, you may find that I'm a bit more stressed. I'm ah, a bit more snappy. Yeah. I'm a bit like, and that's all self-awareness, right? But we're scared of saying that because we want to be perfect mm -hmm. all the time. And we want our partner to be perfect. And I'm not scared to say to Riley, like, hey, I'm going to be a bit more like, you know, on edge. I'm going to be a bit more like, not like in a, in a crazy way, but like, you know, I may be a bit more stressed this week. I may be a bit more overworked this mm -hmm. week. I may be coming home and not want to talk about my day because I'm really tired, right? These are all healthy conversations. Or saying to your partner, like, I've got a really big thing on Tuesday and I'm preparing for it. So Monday night, I'm, you know, and so I please communicate your why to your partner, not just the what, because chances are you're losing everything in translation because your partner can connect with your why even if they can't connect with your what. Why? If I say I need time to myself, someone may not understand that. But if I say I need time to myself because I'm tired, someone can accept that and understand mm -hmm. that. And so give your, again, what you just said, set your partner up for success with you. Don't wait for them to fail. Yeah. Um, all right, so yeah. I love this, and I we definitely got to talk about that last okay. piece. A quote of yours that I freaking love is, love doesn't disintegrate overnight. Mm. Dude, again, that really hit me, because the amount of people are just like, I blinked, and like our relationship yeah. fell apart. That freaking winds me up, yeah. because you never just blink, ever. And so when I go, what is it that people are, aren't addressing where they feel like they've blinked and now sitting in front of them, the person they used to love is no longer the person they even feel like they know. Yeah. I think the challenge is we think we fall in love overnight 
And that's why we think no. we fall oh. out of love overnight, right? We want to find that moment that we fell in love. Oh. That was it. Our wedding day, our engagement day, or whatever it was, the day we had this day, and we're like, we fell in love. And that's why we assume, oh, you can fall out of love in a day. And the truth is we know that both of those are untrue because there were many days, many weeks, many months, and many years that led to the day you said, you're not right for me anymore, right? There were so many. It wasn't one moment. It wasn't one argument. There were hundreds of moments. There were tens of arguments that led to that one day that you told someone, I don't think we're right for each other anymore. I love your question because I think it's so important to address that love doesn't disintegrate overnight. And what I find is that we're holding on to a particular picture of love. We have an image of what love is and we don't have an image of what it could be or how it grows. We don't want things. We, if you think about how we think about things, we're like, Let's go back to the place we first went on a date. Mm. There's something nostalgic about that, but there's something limiting about that too. We always want to go backwards. Our wedding day was the happiest day we had. Mm. We're not open to the fact that doing new things together, changing, growing. What I love about something that you and Tom do, you have your tradition of where Tom flips you down, like holds you, yeah. right? But you do it in lots of different places. Mm. You're not limiting it to, we can only do it in the place we met because that's what it symbolizes. Mm. So I think a lot of couples are trying to have the same love instead of a new love. So there's two types of relationships. One is what I call an old love that becomes old. You've been in love with this person for a long time, but you got bored of each other. It got old. Mm. It, doesn't, it didn't feel new. Then you have an old relationship like yours and Tom's, 20 plus years, but you keep finding new things about each other, it keeps it fresh. So those are the two options we have. You either live in a world where you've been with someone for a long time and it got old, old, old. Mm -hmm. Or you live in a relationship where even though I've been with someone for a long time, I'm always discovering new things about them. I'm always wanting to grow. And I think that's where love disintegrates is when we say our wedding day was love, now what? That moment was love. I didn't get that. I didn't get that. I didn't get that. I didn't get that. And then all of a sudden now I'm dealing with the leftovers. Um, and I share four E's in the book for growing intimacy in a relationship. And this is how your intimacy has to change. So the base level of spending time with someone is doing entertainment together. Far too many couples, the only time they spend together is watching a show. Mm -hmm. That is a very low vibration of intimacy. Why? It's a very low shared experience. When you watch a show together, it's not deeply meaningful. And your response to it is not deeply meaningful. You watch it, you say, oh, that was a good episode. <laughs> yeah, great. All right, let's go sleep, right? And that's what we connected on that day. We connected on something shallow mm -hmm. in a shallow way. How does that create depth and intimacy? I'm not saying don't go to the movies. I go to the movies with Radhi. I, I do a lot of entertaining things, but that can't be your only form of mm -hmm. connection. Like, well, we spend two hours together every night. Well, no, you don't. You watch two hours of TV together every night. Intimacy dips as the vibration dips. The vibration of connecting over entertainment is so futile that it does not create a deep relationship. Mm -hmm. Better than entertainment is experiments and experiences together. Let's go experiment. Let's go try pottery. We've never done that before. The definition, uh, let's go try archery. We've never done that before. Uh, let's go, um, I don't know, to a VR room or an escape room. Let's go do something we've never done before. What this does is it puts you on an equal playing field. Most of the time what happens in our relationship is we do something our partners knows more about, mm -hmm. so they're teaching us, or we do something we know more about, so we're teaching them. I, if me and Riley are in the kitchen and she's teaching me about herbs, I know nothing, she's the expert. If, I don't know what I know more than Riley, but if I'm doing something else, I'm teaching her, right? And what ends up happening in that is we're not having a shared experience. Mm. Because one person is the expert, one person's the student. There's no shared experience there. One person's teaching, the other person's learning. So when you go and do something that neither of you are good at, you're on a level playing field. Now you're truly having a shared experience. I remember this the first time me and Radhi went snorkeling, the first time we went 
um, paddle boarding. The first time we went surfing together. We'd never done any of these things independently. And when we did these things and we tried these new things out, you learn new things about your partner. That's so, is it the fact that you're also struggling together? Correct. Yes, yeah, exactly. You're both going into beginner mode together. Right. When now all your flaws come out, your good things come out, your quirks come out, like more of you is exposed in a healthy mm -hmm. way. So that creates intimacy yeah. and newness. Even, not even, it's not about more, but another deeper or way of deepening intimacy is getting educated together. When you go and learn together, mm. maybe you go to therapy, maybe you go to coaching, maybe you go and do a course together. Maybe you're both learning from experts and masters and teachers together. When you're learning together and then you reflect, it's so powerful. I know you and Tom know all about that. Like when you feel you've been in a room and you've both learned something or you've come out of a podcast and then I know you, when, you, when you're reviewing the podcast, you're both listening to yeah, the same yeah, podcast. Yeah. I can only imagine the conversations you have. Mm -hmm. And then higher than that, or a deeper way than that is engagement. And what engagement is when you go and serve together, when you go create an impact together. Yeah. Maybe you go help out a soup kitchen. Maybe you go feed the homeless. Maybe you go and take care of animals, whatever it may be. Like when you go and serve together, when you go into the trenches together, when you go and struggle together, that builds intimacy. The problem is as relationships get longer, we do less and less of all of these things. We hang on to entertainment and then we wonder how the love disintegrated. Yeah, God, that is so freaking beautiful. And being able to understand ahead of time um, can, like, I think, save a lot of relationships. But even if you find yourself in the moment where maybe your relationship, you're not feeling like you were really connected, I think so many of the things that you've just broken down, it's never too late. Like, So where do you think at the point of, is there like, okay, now I should be splitting and finding somebody new because I'm not right in this relationship or they're not right for me. Where yeah. is that fine line? It's a big question. We spend a bunch of chapters in the book like really going through this because I don't think it should be a flippant decision. It shouldn't be an opinion. It shouldn't be a quick thing. There's a lot to value. One of the things I encourage all couples to do is expand their scorecard. So I think we score keep a lot with our partners. We score keep like, oh, I always say sorry in an argument first. Mm -hmm. One nil to me. Um, oh, I always uh, think about the weekend and plan events, two nil to me. Like we're constantly thinking like one up on the partner. And I often ask people to zoom out and do an activity which is a five level scorecard. So write down the words physical, mental, emotional, financial and spiritual. And then write next to it the name of the partner you think leads on that area. Mm. So when I think of physical, I'm talking about physical groceries, I'm talking about physical things around the home, cleanliness, keeping the home a nice space, uh, creating a nice environment, right? That's physical. Mental is like who's leading the organizing, the trips, the planning of the house. Emotional, who's leading emotionally and intimately? Who's leading financially? And then who's leading spiritually, energetically? When people zoom out and judge their scorecard this way, more often than not, people find they're a lot more equal. But when you zoom into your little area of what you think you do more, it's really easy for you to be like, well, I'm the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. I, I'm doing more for this relationship. But when you zoom out and you look at a relationship, you go, oh, oh, they're actually doing a lot more than I thought. And I think you have to do that activity. And if you find that there's still a massive discrepancy, that's when you're having the leaving conversation. Yeah. But if you do that activity and you go, they do more than I even thank them for. And I realize, mm -hmm. I feel like that. I do that rather oft with rather often. And I find every time I do that, I'm actually not smart enough to notice the good she brings to a relationship because sometimes it's more intangible. But the intangible stuff is really powerful and it's so underestimated. We, we estimate the tangible stuff as being the real success. Mm. But someone who emotionally regulates a relationship, someone who mentally regulates a relationship is so powerful. I actually love that you said that because someone being um, identified as the lead of taking that is important because I think so many people come to it and it's like, well, what are you doing? Totally. What are you doing emotion? Well, you know, like I've done this. And so actually saying, actually, one of us is better at it. And then Tom and I have had that discussion. Yes. I'm way better at it than he is. <laughs> way... He could go months and then he'd be like, oh shit, I feel really weird because I haven't connected with my wife. Yeah. Right? Whereas <laughs> I will see it in week two and I'll be like, oh babe, we're yeah, getting yeah. dangerous here in another two weeks. That's when you're going to feel it. Yeah. And because we've identified it, I now don't feel bad or neglected yes, about the fact yes, that he's yes, mom. Yes. It's like the poor guy, it's just not his expertise. Yeah. Like instead of judging him for it, we yeah. just accept it. Jay, Love this it. has been so Thank amazing. You. Where can people find your amazing book? Uh, eightrulesoflove.com is the place to find the book. So eightrulesoflove, the name of the book, .com. You'll see this big red 
L O V E sign. I wanted to spread love across the world, so I'm hoping everyone will see this book everywhere. Uh, and of course, uh, on my social media channels, Instagram uh, at Jay Shetty and TikTok at Jay Shetty are the best places right now. Guys, if you want to go deeper and actually know if you are compatible or not, then check out this interview right here with my girl Spirit. Where <laughs> I want to start is I heard you say something super freaking powerful, which was there's a massive difference between chemistry and compatibility. Oh, and yeah. like I'd mentioned in my intro, chemistry sometimes it just happens you don't have to work at it sometimes it's just sparks flying and you can't help it and there's like such fire between you and that is nature's way of making sure that we procreate right so that's it that is exactly it and so it's all chemical you're not in control of that that's why sometimes if you've ever walked into a room and you've been like oh my gosh, our eyes locked and I was just on fire and everything about them is amazing. And sometimes you don't even want to let them go when you realize they're not the right person for you out of the bedroom and you go, everything else is wrong with this relationship. But my gosh, when we're together, the fire is just incredible. That is chemistry, my dear. Right. But that doesn't last, right? Nature makes sure that you procreate and you basically move on. So exactly. I've been married now for 18 years. Wow. I just had my 18 year wedding anniversary and it has been very difficult, hard work, but mm -hmm. the most beautiful work I could ever possibly do in my life. But yeah. the reason why we have been able to sustain 18 years is because every step of the way we have been in communication about what works for him, what works for me and our compatibility as we change and grow. Like one thing I was very aware of, and I would love to dive so deep with you, girl, is to talk about addressing issues as they come up how mm -hmm. to make sure that you are compatible and not just staying with someone because you're holding on to an old fiction yeah. of what you thought you were or were going to be. Yeah. Um, and then making sure that you're addressing that so you don't hold on to resentment and grudges mm -hmm. because those are the things that I think will eventually be the downfall to people's relationships. And it becomes a point where it's been splintered for too long. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about the process from chemistry to then finding out if you're compatible and yes. then we can go down to how we can make sure that we don't then become resentful and grudgeful down the road. I love this. We are talking about everything that I want to talk about. So this is so exciting. <laughs> okay. And it's important too. And the reason for that is because oftentimes people are afraid as chemistry changes, they're afraid and they mistake the chemistry changing for them falling out of love. Okay. So what happens is when we first have initial chemistry, we call it NRE, which stands for new relationship energy. When we have new relationship energy with somebody that we first start dating, it's everything is incredible. Everything is amazing and intense. And our bodies literally respond to that chemistry. We have more dopamine flowing in our bodies, more adrenaline flowing. It's literally a chemical process that allows us to feel what feels like love, but it actually is lust, right? So just like you said, it's the thing that really makes our heart beat faster. It makes our palms sweaty. It makes our pupils dilate. The thing that gives us butterflies in our stomach when we're talking about or see the person. And so that actually lasts roughly for about 18 to 24 months. And just as you said, for the exact reason, it's all about procreating. That's why early in our relationships, we find that we are having sex like rabbits. And all we want to do is really just be with them and experience them in any and every way possible. Well, it's your body's way of tricking you into actually getting pregnant, right? But because after we get pregnant, we can't keep focusing on one another, like we actually have to focus on the offspring that we've actually created, the brain goes through another chemical process around 18 to 24 months. And so now, instead of us having all that new relationship energy, now we've got bonding hormones present. So all the oxytocin, all the, the, the good feelings that make us feel more like we're great friends, something almost like how you would feel for a sibling or your best girlfriend or your best guy friend. And all of a sudden, if we're not careful and we don't know what that is, we go, eh, this relationship has lost its fire. It doesn't really have the same flair. And some people will mistakenly go off to start other relationships in search of that new relationship energy. And other people will say, oh, okay, well, 
I guess this what is what relationships are. So now I'm going to accept kind of this humdrum, mellow kind of thing instead of looking to revive my relationship over and over again. So we have to talk about that new relationship energy because when we're in that space also, our brains are so love drunk, literally, <laughs> that we're not sure whether or not we're compatible with somebody. We actually may mistake that chemistry for compatibility, but compatibility is actually very different. And compatibility is about how do we line up in the areas of our lives in such a way that if you never changed and I never changed, we would still fit like a glove and we would both be happy and have our needs met in this relationship for the rest of our lives. So how do you then start to work on that compatibility for a long-term relationship? Mm -hmm. um, because there's going to be many elements. I call it like dust settling. So mm -hmm. let's say you're not compatible and you, you butt heads on something. It's like, well, okay, well, you still have a bit of the flutter, so you don't really address it. And so the dust kind of settles. And then a year yeah. goes by and you still don't really say anything. And that thing that you kind of thought was annoying, but you still love them for it now is just freaking annoying. Right. Um, and it starts to build up. And just like dust settling, it becomes so big it's, you can't clean it anymore. Yeah, they're deal breakers. And it's so funny, you know, I just found this meme the other day that I shared with my husband and I said, this is how relationships work. And it said, you know, early in the relationship, when you're first lying together in bed at night, all you want to do is put your head on their chest and listen to their heartbeat. And that is the rhythm that rocks you to sleep. And then somewhere years later, you go, you know, I'm going to record you at night so you can hear how loud you're snoring because I want to kill you and I want you to know it too, right? Right. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like that didn't happen overnight, right? It's right, not like you right. woke up one day and went, oh, yesterday I loved it and now it just freaking annoys me. So where's the gap? Because that's, yeah. I think, something that we people don't talk about enough about how to avoid those exactly. little things that end up becoming like the biggest freaking splinter in your relationship. Yeah. And I say you have to learn these things so that you can avoid what I call a starter marriage, which is you marry for the wrong reasons. All of a sudden, somewhere down the road, years later, you find that this is not the relationship for you. And unfortunately, in order for both of you to be happy, you wind up having to leave and be with other people and take what you learned with you. So these are the tools and the lessons that we really need to learn in order to avoid the starter marriage, okay? And so what I like to tell people is when you are dating, that is the perfect time to really really go slow and take stock. And you have to see dating much like you see interviewing for a job. So if you've ever been a supervisor or a manager, I want you to think about dating in the very same way because you are hiring for the most important position on earth. <laughs> and that position is for your life mate. And that's how we have to see dating. We have to look at the individuals that we are dating as potential candidates to fill this position instead of dating, thinking that this person is supposed to be our life mate. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we give boyfriends or girlfriends the husband or wife experience when we don't even know if we should be hiring them for that position. OK, so it's got to be like a test drive. So when we're first interviewing people, they're like candidates and you go, well, tell me about yourself. Well, tell me where you're from. And you're thinking about them within context of your employment. Right. In, in terms of the organization that you're thinking about having them come on board. You might like them and interview them a second time or a third time. You may have them meet other employees of the company in social settings, over dinner, or in the boardroom during meetings. Dating should be very similar to that because what you're wanting to learn is who this person is. You're wanting to get past the representative, right? Because their representative is not who they are. Their representative is who they think you want them to be. So that's very important because they're filtering you and trying to adjust while you're filtering them. Mm -hmm. So we've got all this early filtering going on and we need to see them in different environments and then compare, do they actually appear to be who they say that they are over time, right? Because people will tell you one thing, but their behavior can tell you something completely different. It takes time in order to see that. And the hard part is, unfortunately, not only do we often jump in bed too quickly, 
And the reason why the jumping in bed is important is because the moment that we bring sex in, all of those hormones flood our systems and it clouds our judgment. Again, we go back to being love drunk. I literally am intoxicated the moment that I have sex with you and I am not going to see you the same. So it's like going to bed at two with a 10 and then waking up at 10 with a two. What do you They're mean by that? Great. I, don't... I mean, so if I'm partying, I'm having a great time. By the time I go to the club and it's 2 a.m., the person that I'm leaving with in my drunken state, uh... in my high state, in my party state, they are a 10. <laughs> it's two in the morning. I'm feeling great. Everything is wonderful. I am going home with a 10, Okay. Then at 10 in the morning, after all of those intoxicants have come out of my oh. bloodstream and I'm sober and I roll over and I wake up with you and all of your makeup is on the pillowcase or all of my face <laughs> hair as the man is on the pillowcase and we've taken off all of the lashes and the nails and I get to see you, all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, who are you? You're a two. You are not a 10. You are a two. You are not somebody that I would have actually dated. So we need to be able to see that person with a clear eye and sex complicates that because it literally clouds our brain. It gives us a brain fog. So the longer that we can hold out on the sex, the more objective we can be about who the person is. Mm -hmm. That's important. The other part of this is we have to know that over time, time is what allows us to see a person in different situations. We can talk about theoretically whether or not we think we line up in a particular way, but having actual experiences where we're challenged to see who we are is totally different, which is why to go back to the starter marriage, I often tell folks, if you really want to know who somebody is, divorce them, right? Or break up with them. Many people learn way more about a person at the end of a relationship than they did in the entire relationship. So it is not about time that heals all wounds or creates something different, but what you do with that time. So therefore, it is also important in terms of compatibility, how we date a person. If every time we date, we just go out to dinner and a movie, we're not having any conversation. How do I know about you? How do I know about how you handle challenges? How do I know how you handle being caught off guard? How do I know how you handle social settings? How do I know how you treat other people? If we only date in places and spaces that never really show me who you are, but now when we're together, I'm not dating you to just have fun nights. I'm dating you in places and spaces that require the full range of you to show up. If we don't ever exercise that point of who we are until we're already married or until we've already moved in together or we've already created children or other kind of lifetime commitments that find us stuck together, we've created a whole set of problems for ourselves that now we may be resentful of. Now we may be frustrated with. Now we may become annoyed because I'm stuck with you in a different way and I'm going to make different choices based upon those consequences that we've already created. Ooh, that was so <laughs> amazing, girl. That was fire. Um, so I understand in asking the questions, I love that, take your time. Um, the one thing I always say is you earn your credibility. So it's yeah. over time, right? It's like when you need them, are they going to be there? They, they may say they are, but time and time again, if you've asked, have they showed up? So it's kind of like over time, test, not even test them, but like put them in different situations. I freaking love that so much. Um, so, but what happens though, especially let's say someone like me who's married young, you change over time. Mm -hmm. And so certain things that, you know, may come up as your partner is changing becomes more and more irritable. But again, it's like, well, we've been together for five years or whatever. And so you, you often make excuses for the little things that start to frustrate you mm -hmm. only for it to then build, 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 build. So mm -hmm. let's say someone hasn't, you know, is in the middle of their relationship. And so what you have just said has already passed. They they're, they're stuck. They're, they're like, stuck. we're together. Exactly. They're stuck with me. <laughs> Especially while we're in quarantine and things like that. So, uh -huh. How would you then advise somebody? In fact, here's a question. If you have some animosity or resentment or grudge, whatever word you want to use towards someone, whose responsibility is it to get over it? 
Ah, okay. So the real answer to that is that it's both of your problem because there are three parts to this scenario. There's you, there's your partner, and there's the relationship. And the relationship is its own living, breathing entity. And it's up to the two of you to constantly work together in partnership to resolve the problems in your relationship. So I often tell people, you are not the problem and your partner is not the problem. The problems are the problem and it's up to the two of you to work together as a team to solve the problems. What typically happens though is when one of us is frustrated about a thing, we personalize it and blame the person, right? You are the thing that's making me feel this way. Instead of owning, I feel a particular kind of way or I'm having a particular kind of experience in this relationship with you and that's not the experience that I want. So we spend, unfortunately, too much time talking about the problems Mm -hmm. and not the solution. Oftentimes when I have couples that come in for couples counseling, they can tell me ad nauseum what the problems are in their relationship, right? Because they've talked about it a thousand times. They can say, it was 1976 and you had on the purple shirt and I was wearing that and we were standing over there and we go, guys, so let me make sure we're arguing about something that happened 44, 45 years ago. Okay, so now. The problem is because couples get hung up on talking about the problem instead of we understand, we have communicated, we're in agreement that we know what the problem is, even if we don't see it the same way. We've identified succinctly what the problem is. Now what we're going to do is not talk about the problem anymore, but we're going to talk about all the possible solutions for the problem, whether we're going to implement them or not. Let's just weigh out our options and see what they are. Now, once we brainstorm all of the solutions, we are then going to pick one or two of those solutions to try, okay? Who's going to be responsible for what? Well, I'm going to have to do this part, and that means that I'll have to do this part. Okay, I'm in agreement. Once we come up with the solutions, we have to decide then how long to try those solutions for. Mm. All too often, we say, okay, that's fine, so I'm just going to do that going forward. That is what it is. But because old habits die hard and sometimes they don't die at all, it's important that we decide we're going to try this a new way for a specific amount of time, for the next 24 hours, for the next three days, for the next month. And then we're going to come back to the table to evaluate how well that solution worked. If it worked great, then you continue and you do more of that. But if it didn't work, oh, I forgot I was supposed to be doing that. Oh, I didn't realize you were doing it and that didn't work. We still have the problem. Now we need to get rid of those because those weren't viable solutions for us. We need to go back to the solutions that we proposed and try something else. But unfortunately, what happens is I'm having a particular experience in this relationship. I don't feel like you're getting it. You don't understand it. We're not talking about the actual problem. We're talking about examples of the problem. I call them the leaves on the trees and we never get to the root of the thing. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about all these things that never actually resolve the problem. And over time, I just become resentful. I become frustrated. I withdraw. I check out. Whatever happens, we stop being on the same team in pursuit of solving the problem. Oh my God, so true. And the fact that you put emotion and you connect emotion to all this, like forget it, right? It's just, it becomes this perpetual, like, no, you did this and you did this and it becomes the blaming game. And what I so freaking love about what you just laid out is it's so binary. It's let's do Mm -hmm. this. Let's test it for 24 hours. Let's come back together and let's see how we feel. Did we do it or not? Yes, we did it. Did it work? No. Cool. Move on. Right. It's it's like, it's such a business mind as well. And I love it because it removes the emotion of whatever Mm -hmm. you're feeling right then, which can Mm -hmm. cloud how you are approaching the, uh, the solution. Yes. Because you know, what I really want to do as a therapist is to demystify relationships. I really don't want people to walk around thinking this Disney fairy tale that maybe there's a Prince Charming out there. And if I'm lucky, I might meet them or there is this princess out there. It's like, no, 
there is a science to relationships. And if you learn the science, not only can you have the kind of relationship that you want, you can control the intensity of it. You can control the duration of it. You can control the quality of it. There is a science to every single thing. We just haven't learned how to do it. So I like to break it down into very pragmatic ways mm -hmm. for people to go, oh my gosh, this makes sense to me. Oh, wait a minute. I thought they were the problem. Wait, I'm the problem. I haven't learned how to do it right. I'm not talking about the right thing. I'm not communicating the right thing in order to get what it is that I want. Everything starts with us as the individual and then radiates outward. And if you don't understand that, that's because either you haven't learned to be connected to all the parts of yourself or somewhere along the line, somebody told you that what you needed and wanted wasn't important enough for you to express and advocate for you getting what you want in order to be happy. That is so true, how much of our past carries over into that. So whether it be oh, past yes. relationships or even just parents and teachers. Oh, it, it goes to childhood, to grandparent stuff, to great grandparent <laughs> stuff. Like we learn how to come into relationship through the presence or the absence of the people in our lives, whether it's our parents being in relationship and how they did it, step parents and, and extras, parents staying single, quality of relationship. We learn how to do it. And then as adults, we're just simply reenacting the same patterns over and over from our past. That is so true. The, the advice my grandmother gave me just before I got married, she's, I'm Greek. So she came from a tiny village of this really, really old Greek woman, can't speak a word of English. And she pulls me aside and she's like, look, if Tom has to hit you, don't worry. It probably means you deserve it. My oh. grandmother, and so it's like, I understand where she comes from. So I actually just mm -hmm. thought it was quite funny. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something actually heartbreaking to it in that that's the belief that she had growing up. Mm -hmm. And what if I was born, not in London, but what if I was born in that same village? Right. I wouldn't have thought of it as, oh, yeah, yeah, you're so cute. I would have gone, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So I love what you're saying about it just not being your parents, but yeah. basically where you come from, where your parents have come from, mm -hmm. your great grandparents. Um, and how tightly you're still connected to that. Because like you said, had you still been there, had you still been a part right. of that culture, it may have been supported in a different way. Yeah. So if you were in a situation and your partner struck you, you may be supported in a different way. People might say, mm -hmm. girlfriend, you don't have to take that. Mm -hmm. Let us help you, let us rescue you. And all of a sudden you go, okay, I matter and that's not acceptable. But had you been back there, then it might've been, well, what did you do? Yes. Well, go back and apologize, right? That yes. teaches you a different experience. And that's yeah. what I so freaking love about you, your message and everything you do, because you, um, eliminate the emotion when you're giving people advice. And it's so tactical that yeah. no matter where you're from, what your beliefs are, you do the try this and this, right? And so it's like, you're, you're kind of a able to cross all these boundaries and all these other people's beliefs and visions of what mm -hmm. they think a relationship should be, can be. And you're mm -hmm. kind of just breaking that down with very tactical um, guidelines. And yes which I think is so impactful, girl. Like that's yeah. so freaking amazing. Oh, that's so awesome. Listen, I tell people at the end of the day, we all are human beings and to break us down into our smallest parts, there are three parts of ourselves, okay? There are our feelings, our thoughts, and our behaviors, okay? Your feelings are your body's alarm systems to what you need, okay? So for example, if I'm cold, that's a feeling. If I'm hungry, that's a feeling. If I'm horny, that's a feeling. Everything that we are boils down to our feelings of what we need. Our thought process are the strategies that we think about in order to get our needs or our feelings met, okay? And our behaviors are what we execute, the strategies that we execute all in pursuit of getting our need met. So for example, if I'm hungry, I may then think, 
okay, so I'm hungry. How am I going to no longer be hungry? Well, I could go in the kitchen and cook. I could go to the local deli and go buy something. Okay, yeah, I'm tired, so I'm going to just go buy something. So then we get up and we go down the street and we buy what it is that we need in order to satisfy the hunger. Okay, so now the behavior is I get up and I go do a thing. The important thing that we need to remember, though, is that as it relates to our feelings or our needs, by the time that we feel them or recognize that we have a need, we're already operating at a deficit. (laughs) So we're already slightly in trouble. By the time I realize that I'm thirsty, I'm already dehydrated. (laughs) Right. By the time I recognize that I'm hungry, I'm already in need of nutrients. And we also need to know that our needs are different over time. They're more intense or less intense over time. Sometimes I'm ravenous. I could absolutely eat an entire cow. And other times, oh, I could go for a nosh, just like something to take the edge off. But if we're not in tune with our own needs, one, we can't communicate that to somebody else. And two, we can't properly figure out what options or strategies we need to execute in order to get our needs met. And so unfortunately, when we're disconnected from our needs, when we're disconnected from our feelings, then how do we enter into partnership with someone else, expecting them to be able to meet what we don't even know how to identify for ourselves? And that's important in relationship because I cannot respond to what my partner doesn't communicate. And I can't help to meet a need and know how to behave or show up in order to help get the need met if I don't even know it or can't communicate it for myself. That's amazing. But what happens if the wiring is crossed? So mm-hmm. you you say, okay, I feel really lonely. So, um, or like I'm, I'm, I'm feeling lonely, so I go to a bar, right? Mm-hmm. And so my behavior is, I don't want to be, I feel lonely. So my behavior is let's find someone to not be lonely with. So mm-hmm. let's say you pick someone up and then, you realize the next day that didn't fill the hole that you thought it would. And so now Mm -hmm. your behaviors, your feelings, and your thoughts all are actually working against each other instead of working Mm -hmm. for each other. So they're out of sync, right? Yeah. So that means that I'm executing the wrong strategies, which oftentimes is the problem. That's why in therapy, when we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, we're talking about if you can change the way that a person thinks and the way they behave, everything else falls in line, right? So if I'm feeling lonely, only one of the strategies that I thought about was go to a bar. Now, perhaps I only thought about that strategy because I don't know anything else. I don't have any other options or coping skills. I haven't expanded myself enough to know that there are other options or other means to get my need met. How you know if you have the right strategy, much like when we were talking about solutions, how you know if you have the right solution is, I actually went to the bar, I did everything that I did, did it satisfy my need? If it didn't, then I need to go back to the drawing board and how I'm thinking about getting the need met. And sometimes I have other options that I've thought about, but I haven't tried them, or I need some help maybe some professional help, maybe my social support, friends, family, maybe some online learning, but I need to figure out some new strategies and how to meet people to satisfy this cure for loneliness. And sometimes it becomes so convoluted because we may have trauma or other experiences where there are other needs that have to be met before that need can even be touched. So perhaps if I have abandonment issues or if I have a trauma history, perhaps the reason why I feel lonely is because I can't execute the right behaviors in order to connect with people. I go to bars when I should be going to bookstores. I talk to guys when I should be talking to girls. I'm thinking sex when I need to be thinking emotional intimacy, but I'm thinking about and executing the wrong behaviors that are not meeting my needs. So Let's talk about forgiveness. So I have always been the person and my husband and I both came to an agreement that if one of us says sorry, the other person must receive it immediately because it's <laughs> because it's oh, hard wow. to say sorry. And okay. so in if someone's stepping out of their comfort zone and mm-hmm. saying it, 
it's almost like you want to reward them for stepping out of their comfort zone. So mm-hmm. saying sorry is, it needs to be received well. But I read a quote of yours that I'm going to read out loud that I think is so freaking awesome. It said, you are not required to forgive. Contrary to popular opinion, you are not required to accept anybody's apology just because they offer it to you. Their expression of regret or remorse is theirs to express. You're choosing if how and even when to respond to their expression is entirely up to you. So talk Mm -hmm. to me about it because it has been literally the antithesis of what I've been doing. Oh, I love this. Okay, so I say that before we can forgive, we have to first do our own self-care and we have to heal before we can forgive. And I also believe that unfortunately, a lot of us have the wrong idea about forgiveness because we somehow think that forgiveness means that I have to still continue in relationship with you. Forgiveness means that I have to continue to give you access to me. And I absolutely do not agree with that. I think I can forgive you and accept that that has happened to me and move on from my own healing and still put up appropriate boundaries or barriers that says I choose to no longer engage you, right? And that is a very important thing because I can say, you know what? I will forgive you. I will forgive you for violating my boundary, for causing a wound in me. But it does not change the fact that I am wounded you know, and how I love to give this to people, right? I can say I have the best of intentions. I can say I didn't mean to hit you with my car, but it doesn't change the fact that if I hit you, that you're hurt just because I didn't mean to do it or even worse, because I made a bad choice. And this is the other thing I love for people to say, I made a mistake when they really made a bad choice. The bad choice is I did what I wanted to do at that time. And they go, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. No, a mistake is like, I didn't mean to run over your foot because I miscalculated and I didn't see it there. That's different than I slept with somebody because the entire time I wanted that more in the moment than I wanted to honor my commitment to you. And because I chose me, that should not then put you under obligation to have to let me off the hook for that wounding, to have to move on from that wounding. And that's the other part is that people want immediate forgiveness. They don't want forgiveness as part of a process to healing. They say, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I said, I'm sorry. That's it. You have to accept that. I'm sorry. And let's just move on. But meanwhile, you're bleeding and wounded in the background. And that leaves you to have to do the work of your own healing by yourself. I think that that's so disingenuous. And so if somebody says, I recognize that I did something that wounded you and I apologize for doing that. Now, how can I be there for us to tend to your wound? How do I make you whole again? And it's not simply by giving you lip service to say, I'm sorry. That's for you. That's not for me. I'm glad that you feel remorse or regret. Now let's tend to the wound that you created in me for as long as that takes and for however that looks like in order for me to heal. You don't get to decide that and two words are not going to heal that. Girl, that's so true because actually now as you're talking, because we've been together for so long, we do things naturally now. We do that. It's, um, thank you for saying you're sorry. I really hear you. I appreciate it. I'm still actually upset. So just give me a while. And so Mm -hmm. it becomes a, it's not like, well, I'm sorry, so you've got to forgive me and you've got to pretend that nothing ever happened. Like that doesn't solve anything, right? Um, uh-huh. But it is the give me the grace to work through the emotion of this. Um, and I and totally- the grace is the big part, right? Because yeah. I tell every couple, you know, if you're, if you're together forever, you are going to need grace. Yes. So treat the person how you want to be treated in the experience. Sometimes it's very easy for us to be the victim. Oh no, you hurt me. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So no, remember, and I'm going to hold on to that and I'm not going to allow myself to heal. I'm not going to allow myself to get over it. It's usually a very manipulating kind of thing. And it may be subconscious. We don't always do it because we want to, but sometimes when I'm wounded, you treat me differently. You treat me the way I really want to be treated. You give me extra Uh attention. You talk more nicely to me. You're softer. You come home on time. You do things and I want that to last. So maybe I want this pain to linger. I'm going to relish in it because there's a payoff, right? 
Or maybe I've learned somewhere or I'm afraid that I let you off the hook too early. You're going to do it to me again. Mm. So I'm going to hold it over your head. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hold you hostage to it. I'm going to remind you over and over. Remember you did that thing. Remember I'm still hurt. Remember. And so we do that over and over. So the person goes, wow, okay, I really get it. Wow, that really affected you. Because we're trying to get a reaction from them, which is their understanding of the depth of the wound that they've caused. And we're afraid that if we let them off the hook too soon, then they will do it again. And then the other part is the person hasn't given us what we need in order for us to feel confident that they actually understand Mm -hmm. the wound that they've caused. So we'll linger in it. And every time they do it again, we'll go, see that? That's what I'm talking about. You never listen to me. You don't understand. And we'll keep bringing it up over and over. That's why sometimes couples will talk about the same problem. They'll go, yeah, 20 years ago when he cheated on me. And they go, man, if I would have known that it was going to be all this and you said you would forgive me and and they go, yeah, but you know, the minute that I forgive you, you're just going to do it again. Because oftentimes the partner doesn't take the accountability that's required. They only give you the lip service of the I'm sorry, but no plan, no teamwork, no, uh, uh, no sense of responsibility, no, this is how we'll go forward and how I will own it and how I will hold us together to make sure that that never happens again. So there are all these self-serving ways where if we wound each other and we don't really do the work to heal each other and just give each other quick quick lip service. You love me. You're supposed to forgive me. Or I realize that I'm required to forgive, even if I really don't feel it, but I have to pretend that is why we find ourselves stuck. And often if we make agreements to forgive, but we really don't, We don't feel like we can come back to the person to say, look, I'm still wounded. I'm still hurt. Mm. I'm still holding on to it. So instead of being able to express that and that be a problem we work together as a team on, now I have to pretend. I have to pretend that we're okay because I made the agreement. So now I'm really resentful, but I can't talk about the real thing. So I'm going to yell at you about the trash and the dishes and you working too late and you doing everything else. So we have to give our relationship the space and, and, and breath for transparency, for honesty, and for humanness to be able to say, listen, I know I made an agreement with you, but that's when I thought I could do a certain thing. Now that I'm checking into who I am and what I'm actually feeling and what I actually need, I can't honor that agreement. And so now we need to consider that we need to do things a new way for our relationship. Because again, there's you, your partner and their relationship. I can't give this relationship what I agreed to. So you and I have to come up with a new agreement that works for our relationship. Mm -hmm. My husband and I have one agreement and it's to use a word important to me. If you say that important, We probably say it two or three times a year because it means if I say it, you have to drop everything and not even ask why. We've just got that in grip. We don't abuse the word. So we use it very sparingly. Mm -hmm. And only once in 18 years have we clashed and we both said it was important and he didn't come over to my side. And so in that moment, I was like, I literally, it was a very emotional moment. I broke down. I said, I need you. I don't think I've ever needed you more than I need you now. It is important. And he was going through similar emotions. And so he's like, I can't be there for you. I have to Mm -hmm. go on this this trip. And the trip was so important to him that we we collided. And I was like, this is that moment. This is that yeah. moment that if I do not let go of it, if I do not process what we are going through right now, and I do not accept what has happened, discuss it, of course, talk through it. What are we going to do next time? All of that. But now it becomes a, well, why should he come to my side? Why am I not willing to go to his? So it's it doesn't just go one way, Lisa. It goes yeah. both ways. And now I have to actively forgive him wholeheartedly because Mm -hmm. like you said I could tell within just humans and myself that if in five years I ask him to be there for me and for whatever reason he's not I'll be like see you did it again and he'd be like what do you mean I did it again so Mm -hmm. um so how do you work through the forgiveness and it's not really forgetting it's let's say learning from it instead of Mm -hmm. holding on to it Mm -hmm. So there's a difference, right? I tell people all the time, 
You'll never forget anything in a relationship. Right. Most, listen, especially as women, right? We're like <laughs> elephant brains. We can remember everything, right? But the key is not to forget, but to pay attention to how it makes us feel. And if we're still holding on to negative energy about a thing, then that means that we need to heal it. Okay. Every relationship has scars. Scars are okay because scars are the testimony to what you survived. Scars are perfectly fine. Open wounds though, over time will fester, will become toxic and that will kill a relationship. They're the things that when I'm working with couples, they'll go, you know, I really should have left you 10 years ago because I knew that that moment that changed everything that changed for me the way that I saw you. I was never the same with you again. Yes, I was here, but I never trusted you the same. I never could open up to you the same. Our lovemaking was different. Our respect level, how we talked, we started to go our separate ways. Everything changed. Like they can find those defining moments where they unfortunately didn't do what they needed to do in order to heal the relationship. And this is why I strive to just drive home the point over and over that your relationship is different from you and your partner. There are things Mm -hmm. that you both need as individuals. And sometimes those things will be different than what's in the best interest of your relationship. And so how you have a successful relationship and not just be two individuals living under the same roof, getting your needs met individually from each other, sometimes together and other times separately, is by committing to working in partnership to always do what's in the best interest of your relationship. And if you don't have those agreements, I tell couples all the time, when you're in conflict, 99.9999999999% of the time, It's because you don't have an agreement for how your relationship is supposed to function in that area. So you're operating according to what you want or what you think is best. They're operating according to what they want or what they think is best, but you've never come to an agreement. So this is where I am. This is where you are. Now what's in the best interest of our relationship? Okay, so this is how we are going to function. So a great example is like, let's say that you are a home in bed, set the uh, security alarm on your home every night by 10 p.m. And you like to feel safe and know that everybody is accounted for. But your partner is a party animal. They love to go out. They love to come up with the sun. They'll go to the to the nightclubs all night long. Then they want to go and have a nightcap. Then they want to go have early morning breakfast. And so they want to come in the house at six or seven o'clock in the morning. And you think that is absolutely unacceptable. That is absolutely unacceptable. And your partner thinks, well, I'm not coming in at 10 o'clock at night. That's absolutely unacceptable that you want to control and contain me. So now we have to compromise. And a compromise is where everybody comes to the table and everybody gets up winning or getting something that they wanted but no one person is 100% happy. Because if I win and you lose, then our relationship loses. So we both have to give, we both have to get, and we both have to feel like we've gotten something equally. So perhaps if I'm a 10 person and you're a six, well, I'm not willing to let you stay out till six, but maybe two o'clock, I could see my way to. Okay, well, I'm a six and I'm not doing 10, but maybe I could do three. Okay, so you say two and I say three, how about Mm 2.30, right? Okay, that's great. And at 2.30, when I hear the security alarm go off, I'm not gonna be upset about that because that's the compromise and I know that you're happy. And when you come home at 2.30, you're not gonna be pissed off about that because you know that I feel safe and I honored your needs. And so now our relationship knows how we function. We know what to expect. We know how to govern ourselves. And because we love each other, we found our way to the middle and our relationship has a way to function that we both understand. That's so amazing. And I think it eliminates any judgment, right? Because it's like over time, everyone always thinks they're right. 
everyone. Of course, so it's, of so course. It's, so it's like, what do you mean you're staying out till six, right? It comes across <laughs> with judgment. You're not making them feel good. And now, you know, you're, you're kind of getting those emotions um, yeah. all rattled up where when you come together, you're just going to be butting heads instead of actually coming together, like you said. Oh, yeah. Um, as like a team, I, I say it like um, a tennis match. It's like uh -huh. we're not on opposite sides. We're playing doubles. You're on That's my it. side and we're trying to win the game together. That's it. And so, you know, judgment, I always say if you are judging, whether you're judging yourself or you're judging somebody else, you are really in your ego. That is a very <laughs> egocentric place because it says that I'm right. I know how this should go. And the reason why I say it, that it works both ways is because oftentimes, and, and my office is called the no judgment zone. It's like the sanctuary is what my clients it. have nicknamed it. And the reason for that is because, you know, who we are even changes over time. What we know, the resources that we have, how we see the world, and everybody is doing the best that they can with what they have in any given moment. So if I am now in my 40s judging the choices that I made at 20 and I go, oh, that was so dumb. Oh, what was I thinking? I was just a ridiculous person. Well, my 20 year old self, first of all, was responsible for getting me to the place that I am. And they had to figure out how to do that with way less resources, way less know how, way less knowledge than this 40 year old. So how dare I judge me back then that did the best that they could and somehow it worked out, right? Because here I am <laughs> and they're the ones that got me there. And the same with our partners. Like when we're judging, why would you do it that way? Who taught you how to do it that way? That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, if they've been doing it that way all the way up until they met you, and somehow it's been enough to get them not only to where they are, but has made them who they are to the point that you were attracted to them, it was enough for you to choose them. How dare you decide now from your place of ego that your way is better? Right. So sometimes the best thing that we can do is if we think we have the better way, we model that for somebody by showing them how we do it. And if they think that it's better through their own filter in how they show up in their lives, they'll come over and go, wait, wait, show me that again. Mm -hmm. Or how about we do it your way this time? Because that seems to work. Or, wow, nobody's ever showed me that. And they're, it's easier for them to accept it and easier for them to adapt to it if they're doing it of their own volition, if it's voluntary and it doesn't feel like they're, it's being shoved down their throat. Sometimes even if we have the best way, if it feels like it's being shoved down somebody's throat, they'll reject it just because they're a grown up now and they don't need somebody else telling them what to do in their lives. That may trigger some old trauma history, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful with how we give people who we are. Instead of asking or requiring them to take on our way, we're coming into a relationship. Part of that is for us to give them the space to meet our needs and to give us a different experience. That's why we're choosing partnership. We're not choosing us to be in relationship with. Mm. God, it was really powerful when you did the analogy of your younger self. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's because it's you, right? It's not like someone else where you're saying, oh, well, he is or she's like that. It's like, the 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 point of putting yourself in that position of reflecting back to yourself ha really helps you then mirror yeah. that um, with open eyes. Yeah. Oh, most of us are so horrible to ourselves. Listen, we will have conversations and say things to ourselves about ourselves that we would never dream of saying to a stranger. Mm -hmm. We talk horribly about ourselves in ways that we wouldn't even talk about people that we don't like. <laughs> and so like, right. So like if we would do that to ourselves, then we actually become our own worst enemy. And what's so bad about that is because we're in our own head 20 24 seven, we record these stories and this music that comes to play in the background of who we are our entire lives. And nobody else can free us from that. Nobody else can break us from that. It's why our partners can say, oh my gosh, you look absolutely lovely today. And you go, no, I don't. My hair is too frizzy and I didn't put on my makeup right. We become these self-deprecating people 
because of the own, the conversations that we're having with ourselves all the time from a place of judgment instead of from a place of love and from a place of embracing and moving forward constantly knowing every day I'm one step closer to being a better version of myself if I give myself the grace, the space, and the love to do so. We give it to our partners before we give it to ourselves right. even. But if I'm holding myself to such high regard, if I'm super critical of myself, what happens is we get into this process where we go, well, I'm not treating you any different than I'm treating myself. You know, I'm only asked, I wouldn't ask anything of you that I don't ask of myself. And so if we're super critical, if we're super judgmental, then we automatically get up on this pedestal and expect our partners to meet us there because we're constantly working so hard instead of giving ourselves grace not to know everything, to be able to change what we thought we knew, to expand past and grow past what we've already come to know and to be open to new possibilities that we don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to know everything. And the more open that we are to not knowing, the more we actually learn. Oh, spirit girl, you're freaking amazing. Like everything, <laughs> because, and, and but, I mean, look, relationships is something I absolutely love talking about. But mm -hmm. it never occurred to me until I got into my own relationship, how much of a successful relationship depends on you. Oh, absolutely. You cannot have a successful relationship if you're not a successful you, yeah. because you'll go into the relationship making somebody else one, the center of your world when they should be an enhancement to it. You know, I tell my clients all the time, you have to be having an amazing life and be in progress. And you have to be so far into your enjoyment and your peace that when somebody wants to come in and be a part of that, you go, okay, wait, hold on, hold on because I have to tread lightly. I am so good with what my world is and how it's set up that I don't want to bring anything that would disrupt this piece, mm. right? So that's important. They can't become the center of your joy or your world. And then the other part is they can't become responsible for meeting your need. Mm -hmm. Because again, you have to know your own need. They have to be, you have to strategize and you have to behave in such a way. So they cannot be the person that does that. So unfortunately, so many of us come into relationships looking to be healed, looking to be fulfilled, looking to be taken care of, looking for the other person to give us the experience that we really should be coming into relationships to give ourselves. You could try to give me the world, but if I'm not happy within, if I'm not complete within, I don't care if you came in the house and gave me a thousand roses and a thousand kisses each and every day. If I can't receive it, if I can't embrace it, or if I don't even need it, it's not going to move the needle at all. So I have to know what I need. I have to be able to communicate what I'm going to do in order to execute getting the need met. And then I have to be able to have this kind of go back and forth with you, knowing that it's constantly changing in intensity. It's constantly changing in quality. I'm constantly growing and changing. And we have to be in communication with each other to make sure that as we ebb and flow and change and grow, that we're constantly moving in the same direction in our relationship. Hell yeah, girl. Okay, so if someone is in that situation right now where um, they haven't been ebbing and flowing, they haven't been communicating, and they're starting to feel the dust settle, what are mm -hmm. three things that you that they can do immediately in order to start to unwind that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first and foremost, we have to acknowledge, we have to be willing to acknowledge the ugly, the hard, the scary, to be able to verbalize between each other that we have a problem. OK, because we cannot change what we will not acknowledge. So if we're walking around, acting a certain way, recognizing that something is wrong, but we've never verbalized, Houston, we have a problem. We have to be willing to do that. Having the courage and realizing that neither of you are the problem. Right. So we have to talk about that. We have a problem so that we can work together to solve the problem. OK, the other part of this is that we have to be honest with each other about whether or not we are still motivated to solve the problem. <laughs> it takes. Oh, yes. Because mm -hmm. listen, sometimes we're already out the door. Yeah. Sometimes we've already done our healing work and we are over this relationship 
or we've been so wounded that we know ourselves well enough to know, I don't care what you do. I don't care what you say. We are long past the point of return. I won't ever be able to feel for you the way I need to in order to be happy in this relationship. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that that has nothing to do with the person that has to do with you. That's a choice, whether you're going to choose to forgive somebody, whether or not you're going to allow yourself to receive the love and the efforts that they make in order to create a quality relationship with you. So you have to decide and both people have to be motivated because if one is not, no matter how hard the other person is working, they can't carry the entire relationship themselves. Okay. And then the third part about this is we both have to commit to also do things to reinfuse the love. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have problems. Yes, we're motivated to working them out, but it took us this long to get here. It's going to take us some time to get out of this and falling in love again is a process. It's not a light switch that we can just flip on because we talked about a problem. It's going to take time. And so how I tell couples how you can kind of cheat to reinvigorate the relationship while you're working on the problems is to do new things with each other in new environments. Mm. And the reason for that, this is going back to now the chemistry, okay? Because the brain requires dopamine. Dopamine is the thing that excites us. It gives us passion, all of those things. Anytime we're placed in a new environment, it automatically sets off different parts of our brain because it's a new environment. So we're trying to take all of these things in. What you want to do is you want to have new experiences fun dopamine inducing experiences with your partner because when your brain releases that chemical which is going to cause you to feel good it creates a state of euphoria doing that activity with your partner automatically pairs pleasure with your partner in your brain and so all of a sudden that when you think about happiness, when you think about fun, when you think about joy, your partner is at the top of your brain. And all of a sudden, the things that you began to, to remember loving about them, the way they smiled, the way it felt good when you were in unison with each other, the way she flicks her hair that drives you nuts, but you can't help but still laugh and get a little giddy. All of a sudden, your brain now gets that reactivation of those feel-good chemicals. And the love that you want, you realize is actually still there. It just needs to be reinfused, reignited, and that tank needs to be filled back up in your relationship. Ooh, mm -hmm. go, so it's go. like, don't stop doing things together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where can people find you, follow you? What should the show um Oh gosh. Doing. Okay. So, so there's going to be some incredible things coming up. Uh, in the meantime, they can find me at talk to spirit on all of my social media. I'm talk the number two spirit everywhere. And every Friday I actually do what, what I call free advice Friday. We've been doing it for like almost five years now where I do a live chat for an hour, a live mental health chat where folks can come over to my Facebook page. It's talk to spirit as well. At noon Eastern Standard Time, I don't know where that is in every other part of the world, so you'll have to do the math, okay? And as well, my therapy practice. I have a great group. I have a whole team of therapists, so if anybody ever needs anything, they can find me at T2S Enterprises. T, the number two S, it's Talk to Spirit, Talk to Spirit Enterprises in Atlanta, but I got a toll free number. So if it works for you, it's 888-718-2T2S or you can find us even on WhatsApp. Amazing. We'll put all of those links in the show notes below. So awesome. guys, guys, if you missed it, just click the show notes below. Um, and seriously, guys, this woman gave so many tactics, so many tips that literally, if you follow them, do it like a spreadsheet. Try a tip that she just suggested and tick it. Did it work or cross it off? It didn't work. Move on to the next one. But seriously, if you actually want to have a long lasting relationship, follow this woman, follow her advice. She's freaking fire. If you're not following me, guys, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribed and this episode did bring you value, guys, click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out, guys. Do you want to learn the biggest red flags that indicate he's absolutely wasting your time and not for you? Then click here. You don't trust that someone's never going to betray you. You just trust that you'll be able to handle it if they do, that you'll be able to walk away. That's a massive key.